Good morning, everyone. Bom dia. We're so happy that you are here at Dimension Science's final 2020 public event, which is celebrating the completion of the program for our initial group of seven scholars who formed our COVID-19 task force uh, scholarship program, and they are all from Brazil. We're proud to close this cycle uh, with a webinar on challenges in STEM careers. We'll hear from our scholars, we'll have a keynote from Ambassador Sally Cowell, and we have two discussion panels, one with postdoctoral fellows from the University of Connecticut, and the other with startup entrepreneurs, Data Sprint from Brazil. I'm Pamela Villars, I'm your moderator for today's call. We are starting something new today, as I mentioned a moment ago. We're offering simultaneous in interpretation in Portuguese and English. You can participate by finding the interpretation tab at the bottom of your screen in the app. Simply choose the language that you want to hear and you will hear it. Um, please keep experimenting until you get it right. We think it will really enhance your experience. So as usual, we'll hear from our speakers and then we'll have a question and answer session afterwards. Any time during the speaker's presentation, you can use the question and answer box to send questions. We won't have translation or interpretation for those questions. So if you would please type them in English, that would help me very much since I'll be the person reading them and sharing them with your speakers. You should know also that we're recording this session and we hope that if there's something you want to refer back to or if you want to send it who, to friends who might be interested, it will be avail available, excuse me, later on our social media channels. So if this is your first time joining us, we want to introduce you to um, Dimension Sciences. Um, our mission is to support the inclusion of minorities in science by fostering f higher education and scholarship opportunities. And we also provide mentoring programs, public events, and we're even, even branching out to providing scholarships for the youngest member of our communities. You can learn more by visiting us on our website at dimensionsciences.org. Now, to start us off, I want to, and am honored to present Brazilian Voices, a women's vocal ensemble that performs at cultural events and philanthropic events they aspire to incorporate the very best of Brazilian culture throughout the world, and we're so happy that they will share their talent with us today. So Brazilian Voices, thank you for being here and welcome. Hello, good morning. Good morning. Can you see us? Can you hear us? Just a moment. If okay. you will start your video, we'll be able to see you. All right. There you are. Hello. Uh -huh. Bom dia, bom dia. Good Thank morning. you, Pamela. Thank you, everyone. We're so happy and so honored to be able uh, to perform for you this morning because we're so inspired by this project, by Dimension Science and the future that you have ahead of you. So for us to be able to, to bring some Bossa Nova music, uh, this is Brazilian Voice, that's right, we're a group of 34 women, but here we have Viviani, the trio, she's a director as well, Beatrice Malni, co-founder, music director, so we're going to bring a Bossa Nova, Aguas de Marso, is that okay? And Lauren Oliveira speaking. <laughs> Thank you for introducing me. Yeah. <laughs> Eu não quero, 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 não
A stick, a stone is the end of the road. It's a rest of a stone. It's a little unknown. It's a slip of lies. It is life. It's the sun. It is night. It is that. It's a trap. It's a gun. The old body blues. A fox in the brush. None in the hood. The song of a thrush. The woo of the wind. A clip, a fall, a scratch, a lump. It is nothing at all. And when we go and talk to the waters of March, there's a promise of life and the joy in That was absolutely lovely. Thank you. Thank what a you. wonderful way to start our morning. So let's enter our program then. One of the things that you'll see is that we are introducing you to some core members of the team here at Dimension Sciences. Uh, so I am uh, honored to introduce Bob Chapman. Bob is a Dimension Sciences co-founder and uh, he is also their strategic director. He's an American with a carioca, and that's a person who's born in Buenos Aires, uh, or sorry, Buenos Aires, listen to me, he was born in Rio de Janeiro. He has a carioca heart, and he brings us together as a team of multiple cultures to celebrate diversity. Um, Bob, welcome. Thank you so much, Pamela. Uh, that was great. Uh, so first, let me uh, express on behalf of the board our appreciation uh, to the team uh, and to our dedicated researchers and scholars uh, in Brazil listening in. Uh, you represent the first class of scholars for Dimension Sciences. And as a co-founder, along with Marcia, I could not be uh, so proud uh, as of you as I am today. I'm also proud to introduce my fellow and newest board member, my colleague and friend, Ambassador Sally Cole. Uh, we are fortunate uh, to mention sciences to have someone with Sally's credentials on our team. Sally is a retired US diplomat with more than five decades of experience uh, in global health, uh, global diplomacy, and is a huge advocate for international educational exchange. So everyone, please welcome Ambassador Cole, who will deliver keynote remarks. Ambassador. Well, thank you, Pam, and, and thank you, Bob, uh, for the kind introduction. And let me say congratulations to all of the scholars. Uh, it's a pleasure to be on this board, and it's a pleasure to be able to celebrate with you this morning. Uh, as Bob said, I've been wandering the world for longer than I like to remember. And I think I've learned a few things in that journey. And, and one of them is that scientific discovery is really the key to a better future. Whether we're looking at climate change or a COVID vaccine or a cure for cancer, we really need the best scientists working on it. And we've learned, we know, that the best scientists don't live in one place, they don't have one skin color, and they don't have one gender. So unless we are broad and inclusive in our scientific journeys, success will elude us. 
I joined the Board of Dimension Sciences because I believe that it can break down these barriers and so contribute not only to important scientific discoveries that will allow us to uh, continue to progress as a collection of human beings on this earth, but will also promote international peace and well being. International exchange has the potential to change the world for the better. As Ronald Reagan uh, once said, there's a spark in all of us, which is lit at exactly the right time, makes us different kind of international scientists and international citizens for the rest of our lives. If you wanna understand the power of international exchange, you don't have to look much farther than, uh, than the news of the week, which is the selection of Senator Kamala Harris as the vice presidential candidate uh, for, uh, to be vice president of the United States uh, in this election. Uh, Kamala's parents, one from Jamaica and one from India, uh, both came to the United States uh, to seek their international, uh, to, to seek international uh, uh, scholarship. And along the way, of course, they, um, they met each other and, and uh, all the rest is, is history. I'd also like to say that while Dimension Sciences has the potential and the plan to expand around the world. It's begun with two very important countries, uh, Brazil and the United States. Uh, in our hemisphere, we are certainly the most scientifically advanced countries and the largest countries and the richest countries. And yet, despite the efforts of, uh, of Marcia and Bob Chapman and loads of other people along, uh, the last uh, century, really. I think Brazil and the United States have never fully recognized their mutual benefit to working together across different fields of endeavor. They've too often turned their backs to one another. And so Dimension Scientists, Sciences will, by starting with Brazil and the United States, also has the potential to see these two important countries uh, come together in productive ways uh, that will benefit not only their two countries, but our hemisphere and finally the rest of the world. So let me say that uh, Dimension Sciences and its ambition to include those of all genders, all races, all countries, simply looking for scholarship and talent wherever it exists is a new and an important step forward in international exchange. So I'm proud to be on this board. I'm proud to share in this moment that all the scholars uh, have. Congratulations to all of you. And I look forward to hearing from the, the panels in the rest of this program. So thank you. Thank you so much, Sally. And thank you for taking time out of your day and for joining the team. Um, we, we are thrilled to have you with us. So moving on, I'd like to introduce the founder and president at Dimension Sciences, Marcia Fournier. She is a Carioca with an American heart, and she sets the vision and gets us on the road to accomplish our goals for inclusion. Marcia is going to present our scholars. Welcome, Marcia. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you for being here. Um, today, I will have the opportunity to uh, introduce you the seven scholars that won the COVID-19 Task Force scholarships. Um, they are masters and doctoral level scientists doing scientific research to help the COVID-19 patients in Brazil. Before this scholarship, they were working without a salary. Uh, which speaks very much to the level of commitment they have uh, with the cause and public health. I congratulate all of them for their resilience and hard work during the past three months. 
um, was a lot of fun to work with them, and I wish them all the best in their future endeavors. I will start by calling three of our uh, scholars, uh, Juliana, Italo, and Glaucia. Be ready, I will bring you to the room. Just a second. And uh, you guys can uh, please turn on your videos. And I think we should have Juliana Italo and Glaucia here. And I will ask them to introduce themselves uh, for two minutes each. And so you get all you uh, get to know um, these amazing scientists from Brazil that are doing this important research that will help pretty much everybody. So I'm going to start with Lausia. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Glaucia Rigoto. I'm a biotechnologist and I'm a master in science. I'm working in the Superação project here in Ribeirão Preto, state of Sao Paulo. And I'm working in the molecular diagnosis of COVID-19. And here we help the society performing tests with the samples that come from the public health system. And actually, we are performing more than 500 tests, and we aim to perform 30,000 tests to help here in the city of Ribeirão Preto, one of the most most affected cities uh, in the state of São Paulo. Thank you so much. Um, Italo, please. Well, um, hello everyone. Good morning. Uh, first, it's a pleasure to me to be attending to this closing ceremony. Well, uh, I'm one of the scholars and my name is Italo Castro. Uh, I'm a recently graduated PhD from University of Sao Paulo. Uh, I'm a virologist and um, during my PhD, I've worked with respiratory viruses, focusing influenza virus and um, I think well during these three months dimension sciences allowed me to work on a project that aimed to better understand the pathogenesis involving COVID-19 and um, during this time we proved that SARS coronavirus 2 hijacks the immune system of patients using in its own favor and um, this hijacking can lead to inability to the patients to fight the infection and can be a way to the virus that used to spread through, throughout the body. And um, we ultimately proved that these findings, our findings, correlates to patient outcome and bad prognostic and can, lead, can be useful to, to the clinicians to develop new treatment strategies. And uh, I would like to thank Dimension Sciences because if it was not for the uh, relating to the scholarship that I received, none of this would be possible. So thank you. Juliana. Hi. So good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And my name is Juliana and I'm a doctor in environmental quality and I have been working with virology since 2014. Uh, I'm working with the diagnosis of the new coronavirus uh, in the state of Rio Grande do Sul at Fevalho University. Uh, until now we have analyzed almost 15,000 samples uh, from suspect patients and 24% were positive for COVID-19. 
the tests that we have done is known as PCR, uh, which is a molecular analysis technique that detects the presence of the virus in the infected patient. So uh, these samples are sent to us by the municipal health departments of um, uh, almost 40 cities. So therefore our work has been helped to speed up the diagnosis and relieve the demand of the state's official lab. So another important issue is that the most proper tracking of viral spread corresponds to the largest and most reliable number of diagnosis patients. So this data should be used in the definition of the steps that the public authorities must be taking to ensure care for the population's health. So I would like to thank uh, Dimensions for supporting these three months. Well, um, thank you. Um, and uh, you guys are gonna have to, the opportunity to meet our, all the scholars in a minute. But I'd like to thank you, Italo, Julian, and Glaucia. It's humbling uh, working with you guys, and thank you for the um, amazing and important work you're doing uh, during this uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you again. Pamela, you want? Yes, so as I promised, you're going to meet other members of our team. I'd like to introduce you to Mariana Sergarbi. She's the head of public relations here at Dimension Sciences. So all of the wonderful communications that go out uh, are the ones that are coming from, um, from Mariana. Uh, Mariana, uh, if you would come off mute and start your video, we would love to have you introduce our next section. Uh, unfortunately, my video is not working. Uh, my Wi-Fi connection is not so good. Uh, but I'm here. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, and I'd like to introduce and call Brittany Knight and Kirby Madison, Madden Hennessy from the University of Connecticut Health Center to talk about challenging STEM careers, a perspective from doctoral and postdoctoral fellows in the United States. Here I am. I'm on video now. So, uh, Brittany and uh, Kirby, thank you for being here, and uh, the floor is yours. Great, so um, thank you for that kind introduction, introduction Mariana. Um, I'm Kirby Madden Hennessy. I am a rising fifth year PhD student at the University of Connecticut in the molecular biology and biochemistry department where I study um, cancer. And today we'll, we will be talking about challenges in STEM as a woman scientist. Hi, my name is uh, Dr. Brittany Knight and I'm a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Connecticut. I'm a trained neuroscientist and I'm uh, focused on creating uh, safe uh, pain therapies for musculoskeletal and osteoarthritic pain. Before we get into challenges that women may face in STEM, I thought I would talk a little bit about what STEM is for those who don't know. Don't know. So STEM was created as an umbrella term for the 21st century jobs focused in technology, science, engineering, and mathematics. These careers can include, but are not limited to, environmental engineers, uh, understanding the causes of environmental issues, aerospace engineers, uh, physicians assistants, doctors, architects, statisticians, forensic scientists, chemists, and biophysicists. The STEM industry has actually grown significantly since 1990. Uh, it's grown actually 79% the number of jobs that are available. Uh, and further ado. So the number of women graduating college has actually steadily increased since the 1940s. And in 1980, women actually surpassed men in the number of bachelor's degrees conferred annually in the United States. And since then, more bachelor's degrees have been awarded to women each year. And as of just last year, in 2019, 57% of college, college graduates uh, were actually female. But in the STEM field, we don't see this same trend. In fact, according to the National Center for Education Stats, between the academic years of 20, 
or 2008 to 2009 and to, uh, to 2015 to 2016, just over an eight-year period, there were about 126,000 more men graduating with a STEM degree, while only an additional 69,000 women graduated with a STEM degree over that same period of time, meaning that about two times as many men were graduating with a STEM degree than were women. If we look at the percentage of men and women across the traditional academic scientific career path, you can appreciate, like we had just said, that about uh, there's a similarity and equality in the individuals that are graduating high school. When we get to the bachelor's level, about 32% of science-related uh, um, degrees are held by women versus two times as many as men. And then further in the PhD level, 25% of PhDs actually are women versus 75% of men, and that stays consistent through research-related jobs. But the number really starts to drop off when, it, when we talk about the top academic positions that are held by men versus women. And then further with the number of individuals that uh, are awarded Nobel Prizes. Now, the top academic positions, you may be curious, they actually differ pretty um, differ by country, but in the United States, the top most academic position is university professor, followed by professor, associate professor, and assistant professor. In Brazil, it's professor emeritus, full professor, associate, and then assistant professor. Now, when we talk about Nobel Prizes, uh, uh, the, in between the time of 1901, when it was uh, created, and 2019, 53 women have been awarded in total Nobel Prizes. And only one woman, Marie Curie, has been awarded twice, uh, both for her Nobel Prize in physics and then later in chemistry. She actually also jointly received Nobel Prizes with her husband, Davy Medal of the Royal Society in 1903 and 1921. Next. I'm trying to change the slide. Why don't you go ahead and we'll wait to see until it moves. Um. Okay, cool. So uh, when we, this, this actually, this, the, the previous slide was actually really interesting because you start to notice that although a lot of uh, women are, you know, going to college and getting these uh, degrees in STEM related fields, you know, what is preventing them or hindering them from pursuing or staying in STEM science and particularly academia, but not, not limited to that. And so we actually looked up uh, some uh, articles on this and this is an adaptive uh, schematic from the World Economic Forum's uh, Global Gender Gap in 2016. And they describe uh, you know, five or six uh, factors here, but there are others uh, just so you know when we uh, may have missed some. And then some of the factors include unconscious bias among managers, that they might be hiring uh, more men versus women, that there are a lack of female role models that are available for women to see themselves represented in the fields that they wish to pursue that women's confidence and aspirations may, may not be as uh, empowered or, or supported throughout their uh, education so that they know that they can do these things. Uh, lack of qualified incoming talent is referring to the ratio of men and women that are qualified for these positions, uh, that if there are fewer of them that have made it to a point where they might be able to do a position, the ratio is different or less than so there are less women that are available to take these on these positions or be hired. There is a pay inequality gap still persistent today. And some women are, are worried about the a lack of work-life balance, being the primary caregiver at home. How can I accomplish a full-fledged career uh, and also take care of the home and the children and, and so forth? So though many of you have probably heard about these barriers that Brittany just talked about, or maybe even experienced some of them yourself. I think in a lot of ways, it's still thought of, of being something of a past, or when it does occur, it's pushed under the rug and not openly talked about. But in reality, it does happen, and it happens more often than you think in today's world. And so we decided to put the question out to the public, and we did this with the help of two of my colleagues, Carrie, who runs a popular science communication Twitter blog, and Sarah, 
who runs a science Instagram page, and we asked them to pose a question to their audience. As a woman, what challenges or stereotypes have you faced working in STEM? And so the experiences and stories that we're about to share um, are quite powerful, eye-opening, and quite frankly shocking that some of these things are still, are still being said um, to women or happening to women in 2020. And so as I read you these experiences, I just want you to ask yourself if you experience this type of culture in your field, would you still want to consider pursuing it? What's the point in starting a career if you're going to have to stop to have kids someday? I get talked over or interrupted a lot, especially earlier in graduate school. I learned to just keep talking or say, please don't interrupt me. But of course, I wish I could speak without interruption. It's hard to strike a balance between femininity and fitting in to lab culture. My PI decided to change my role from a research assistant to secretary while also decreasing my hours. I was the only one in the lab that he did this to. I've been told to wear glasses so people take me more seriously as I was preparing to present at a conference. Always being asked if I plan on getting pregnant during my PhD and always accompanied by looks of concern. I've been completely ignored and I've had male colleagues refuse to make eye contact or shake my hand while next to another male colleague as they did not believe I was part of the research team. I finished my PhD quickly and male students quickly spread a rumor that I had split, slept with my committee. I have had someone ask a male colleague to explain my research while I was standing next to my research poster with my name on it and had to intervene that this was actually my research and to ask me the questions. And so for me, it wasn't a comment or a behavior necessarily that someone else did that, had, that has made navigating sciences difficult or challenging. It's the fact that I was the only female in my class. When I entered undergrad, to be honest, I didn't know that there was a gender gap in STEM. All my science teachers since I was 11 were women, so it didn't occur to me that outside of this area, um, it was actually male dominant. It wasn't until my junior and senior years of college that I truly realized that something looked different in my classes. Um, and by then I was only taking classes um, for my major, which at the time was biochemistry. And so out of the 15 kids in my class, I was the only girl. And not only was I the only girl in my class, but I was the only girl in the entire biochemistry department where all the professors were also men. And at times it was intimidating. Um, I felt like that I always had to prove myself to show that I was good enough, that I could keep up with them. And I'd put a lot of pressure on myself because I had this idea that if I didn't complete this degree, um, not only would I be failing myself, but I'd be failing um, all women in science as I felt like I was the only re representation of us um, within that class at my school. Um, and so although it was difficult and I didn't have that female mentor um, that I could relate to necessarily, the professors that were there were supportive. Um, they wanted me to succeed and they did give me opportunities to do so. But for some um, women um, and others, the, these experiences um, are what at what will end, what will be the end of their science careers um, or prevent them from even entering or majoring in them to begin with. So when we uh, decided to, it was very shocking reading those statements. And, and I, I know some of those things definitely resonated with me and I've experienced them in grad school and even just in college, trying to figure out what I wanted to pursue. And it actually took an internship for me to realize that I didn't want to, I didn't want to do this other thing anymore because it was easier because it was, I was doing it because I was too afraid of trying to achieve the harder thing. And I, I really wanted to study the brain. I wanted to study neuroscience. And, and um, so, so we tried to find some things that other women uh, and uh, have mentioned as uh, means to motivate other women to look past or get overcome these challenges that they might, um, uh, you know, come to during their career trajectory or when they're trying to plan out what they want to do with their lives and when they're trying to figure out what they're passionate about. And so um, 
Forbes actually has uh, several articles, among other, other uh, there's lots of resources out there, uh, but Forbes has published several articles on, on trying to overcome these challenges in STEM. And in the first article that we had found, uh, it was entitled, How Women in STEM Can Combat Interruptions and Idea Appropriations. Elise Stoltz Dickerson, a CEO and co-founder of Sarah, uh, said to first most to stay calm, that you'll most likely garner more respect by remaining calm and composed that you can slightly raise your hand or wave your hand to get their attention if they interrupt you and to say, do you mind if I finish my thought? And she mentions to explicitly use your full voice. You deserve to be heard. If you have something to say, you can say it. And uh, she just su also suggests that if you have the chance to arrive to meetings early and consider sitting at the table near the front. This positioning not only ensures that you are serious about participating, it also sends a message that women do not need to give up a seat at the table for someone else. In another article, Forbes had partnered with Audi of America to create an idea incubator program that was designed to empower the upcoming generation of female STEM leaders. Students from New York, Univers New York University Tandem School of Engineering were tasked with developing solutions to a critical issue facing women and girls today. The task in 2017 was access to reliable and safe, affordable transportation. The winning team of students was presented with the first Audi Drive Progress Grant, a $50,000 scholarship to support their studies. And so Moira Forbes asked members of the winning team for their best advice on inspiring future generations of young women. And this is what they said. If you feel like you're not good at a skill, math is a very prominent example, so she uses this, uh, to not be discouraged and persevere. Skill and intelligence grow with consistent practice and effort. So get out there and don't be intimidated. You can do it. To spark your curiosity in and outside the classroom. There are a lot of tools now with YouTube and online resources that really distill inf or disseminate information in a very uh, easily digestible manner. So you can understand complex topics and then from there you can uh, achieve a greater understanding. To use your unique perspective as leverage. We're talking about diversity and inclusion. Just because you don't see yourself represented doesn't mean you can't. And, and part of that ties into finding a role model. Recognizing the role of role models is very important. Uh, Emily Muggleton specifically says in her interview that women in STEM are basically hiding in plain sight. And that is important when we can to showcase uh, these women so that we see that they are doing these jobs and that we can do it. It is a reality that is real. It's just, it's not as prominent. And so um, I know for me and my experience, it's been, it can be challenging and it has been challenging, but I'm really uh, grateful that I had, you know, those little blips of uh, motivation from other individuals, but it's hard if you don't see them and then you sort of maybe feel like you missed your opportunity. Um, but it's important to know that there are others out there. And Dimension Sciences started a showcasing uh, individuals uh, to help, I think, promote that these uh, women are out there doing these uh, rigorous uh, career fields and it is possible. So before we take any comments and questions, we will leave you with this quote from Alala Yousafzai, who won the 2014 Nobel Peace Prize. I raise up my voice, not so that I can shout, but so that those without a voice can be heard. We cannot all succeed when half of us are held back. Thank you so much. That was really quite inspirational. Uh, really appreciate it. So we do have a number of questions that have come in for the two of you. So um, very relevant topic. It also reminded me of what Paula talked about earlier in, the, in our year uh, when she talked about how we can empower women to make the kind of progress that, that they want to make and should make in our societies. So let's start with something, in fact, that's related to what Paula talked about, and that's unconscious bias. Someone wrote in and asked, okay, we know about unconscious bias, but what about conscious bias? Do you all consider that more or less harmful than unconscious bias? Mm. <laughs> it seems more harmful because they're they're it's like a premeditated thought right they're doing it on purpose um choosing uh yeah that's that's rough um 
I guess, how do you know it is? But even that's worse because then you know, Kirby. Yeah, I would agree with Brittany. I think conscious bias is, both are bad because um, the fact that someone, I guess, doesn't know that they're actually being biased to begin with, um, it's a little concerning, but someone who does it purposefully um, and wants you to sort of know, like, I'm sort of against you, um, or I don't like what you're doing necessarily or whatever it is, um, that's almost more hurtful because um, mm -hmm. it's right in your face. Mm -hmm. So let me link another question to that because someone um, typed in and said, what can we do to empower ourselves when we see this? And so I'd like you to sort of speculate on if we, if we are witnesses to someone expressing conscious or unconscious bias um, did you find any suggestions about how to to step in or empower ourselves i think if you so it's it's hard because if you look at rearing and girls versus boys in the classroom we kind of enable women or we enable boys differently than women. And so I think sometimes it feels like we lose our voice and that we have the power to talk or speak up. And, and, and then if you speak up, you're kind of told not to do that. I actually experienced this situation recently like this. And, and it was only from doing this PowerPoint and researching this topic that I, a little flag went off. Like, you know, I feel like this is, it's because I'm a girl and I was told, I'm, I'm told not to talk like that, or you should be nicer. But I didn't think I wasn't being nice. It just maybe it was a little sticking up for myself. And so I think part of it is, you know, not being afraid uh, to, you know, you're not, not everyone's going to like you and you can't be liked all the time. And you can't be worried about everyone's opinion all the time of you uh, because uh, now then you're losing yourself a little bit and you're only ever carving out all these pieces to make everyone happy, but you can't achieve that. And I think uh, being okay with that and knowing that it's all right because it's normal is, it's, a, it's, you know, it's kind of unsettling. It's like, a, you know, you're kind of at war with yourself because you, you don't like when someone doesn't like you or doesn't want you to achieve something. And then you start, you know, it's like the imposter syndrome. Oh, I can't do that. It, you know, I, it's not possible or that's not for me. So it's, you know, reminding yourself. I like to put post-it notes sometimes with motivational quotes that I see on, on LinkedIn or on the internet, just to remind myself to say like, sort of like mantras that, you know, you can do it. It is fine. It's okay. You know, move on, persevere, a new day. <laughs> so go ahead, Kirby. No, I was just going to add to that. Um, also like, don't be afraid to speak out and think, I think a lot of us think, oh, it's only happening to us. We don't always see it happening to others. But remember, you're probably not the only one. We just read a whole bunch of quotes from many different women all across the world and country. Um, so it is happening to others. And if you speak up, you'll probably find that someone right next to you has, have, has had that same thing or similar situation happen to you. And you always have power in numbers. And I think it's comforting to know that... Um, when you do speak up together, I think you'll find out that you will be listened to. Well, that's the perfect segue into another question. And that might be the one of the answers to this, but I'll ask you all if you have anything else to add, which is how can women in STEM careers help other women in STEM careers? So throughout my um, doctoral degree, you know, we're busy at the bench and we're supposed to do that. But I always found myself doing all these other things because I really like uh, mentorship. And I was in a lab that was constantly had undergrads in it. And I, actually, most of them were, for, were women, uh, uh, female students in a variety of different degrees. And you know what? I thought, you know, that was an opportunity to, you know, because you're doing the science and you're teaching about technique but also you're, you're working one-on-one -on -one and it was sort of a, a cool, a unique opportunity to you know, check in, to you know, make sure that you're, 
forming a bond that you know can have a profound impact because i know there were certain people along the way and, and now being on the side of the coin it's like you really can have an impact on someone so it, it matters what you say it matters how you approach situations and how your behavior you know it's like that um 10 or 90 percent action or i forget the the ratio and how you respond to things and that that's very important because you're 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 a role model when you're put in those positions and so um being involved in f science fairs or uh, teaching someone in the lab you know these are moments that are that you know can leave a lasting impact on someone and so it's important to make sure that you take care to foster those relationships and that you put that effort in because you know, what you are doing can really, you know, shape how someone, you know, uh, is appealed to a certain, you know, science or, or teaching or medicine. Uh, so I think for me that that has been the best way that I have been able to approach it. Um, uh, Kirby? Yeah, I would definitely agree with Brittany. Um, speaking out, finding opportunities where you can mentor and encourage um, young girls, because I think it starts at that age to give them confidence that they can do it. Um, cause you have to build that foundation and then sort of help them along the way. Um, just because they show that even by the middle school age, that girls are already showing less interest in STEM. And I think it's likely due to the fact that they don't have those mentors to encourage them and to have them keep going. Um, so yeah, just, I think outreach, um, positive, uh, reinforcement and positive words to them um, I think really goes a long way that yes you can do it you can do this um, you are good enough to keep going and to succeed in this area okay so I heard speak out mentor and role model um, for other women young to peers mm -hmm. so here's the flip question what can men do to help women succeed and fight these biases in STEM careers? So the, um, in the quotes, and then in the, one of the things that I mentioned to overcome, it sounds like interruptions and being talked, talked over uh, has happened to probably most of us I think for men, if they really care about having a, a nice, a, a not nice, like a, a, a supportive environment for everyone, for the ultimate goal to achieve the question, the challenge that you're trying to do, like science, if you're trying to overcome, you know, do something profound in your, your uh, research program, you know, that's really, that's your, your common goal. That's your common ground. I think knowing that sometimes they do that or being a, like a, uh, self-aware, mindful, mindfulness is big, I think that could help because they might not realize that they're doing it because they've never been told, hey, that's not cool that you do that. Because maybe as women, we realize because we, we're just, we're different creatures, you know, men and women are different creatures. We know this. And so um, I think mindfulness would help if everyone was maybe a little bit more mindful about their behaviors and how that can affect others. And so then maybe you stop and go, oh, just kidding, or, oh, I'm sorry, finish, and then I'll talk, you know? I think that would help everyone just in communication in general. Mm -hmm. Yep, I agree. Um, being aware, being more conscious and being aware of their actions. Um, also, I, I think men can also be uh, mentors or an ally for women. Um, I think they need to be in order for women to progress in STEM in general. So I know I talked about being the only female in my biochemistry department at school, but I didn't, although it was intimidating, I wasn't, they didn't push me to the side. Like they included me in everything and they gave me opportunities to do a, a senior thesis project. And they um, gave me outlets and encouragement to keep going. So I think if I didn't have that, I would have really sort of folded into myself. Um, but the fact that they did do that uh, really helped me. So I, as long, I think if they are aware, conscious of their actions and are willing to be um, allies and mentors alongside with us, I think it could be a step in the right direction for sure. Thank you. 
So here's the last question for both of you, and I'll ask you to answer in your best Twitter version, right? <laughs> so I, I think that's 240 characters, um, if you want to calculate in advance. What is the, the one piece of advice that you would give to a young woman who wants to consider a STEM career or who is interested and wants to move forward? Hmm. I didn't come up with this one, but it's the thing that's resonated in my head since my first day of graduate school, because grad, you know, doing a PhD or any kind of long-term training, it's a marathon and not a sprint, and to make sure that you do things for you along the way. Good. Perseverance is, is key. Thank you. Kirby? Um, I think I would tell them... Uh, don't be afraid to step out of your comfort zone, step out of that box, and it's okay to be challenged and to have challenges, but to persevere, keep pushing, and knock down those walls. Okay, so perseverance in each of those Twitter responses. Oh, all right, we hear you. Thank you both so much for such an illuminating presentation, and, and even more so for you sharing your personal experiences and advice. Um, we really appreciate that. Thank you again. Thank, Thank you. you. So we are going to switch gears and I'd like to again introduce um, a very critical member of the team, Professor Marcio Alves, PhD. He is a Dimension Sciences board member. If you follow our work, you have seen him many times before. He's a full professor at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro and uh, that is one of the top universities in Latin America. So, Marcio, uh, bom dia. Bom dia. Thank you, Pema, for the, uh, the nice introduction. So, the seven scholars select for the COVID-19 Task Force Scholarships went through a highly competitive process to get here today. Help us to celebrate them and their achievements. I'd like to call Isabella, Leonardo, Lili, and Romulo to introduce themselves. So if those scholars would turn on their videos and come off mute, uh, we would be able to hear from you. Marcio, if you could let them know in, uh, who you would like to go first and call each well, scholar. You can, uh, uh, you can start with Isabella, as uh, I, I mentioned before. Hello, everyone. Good morning. It's uh, a pleasure to be here today. My name is Isabella Lemos. I live in Uberlândia, Minas Gerais. I am a PhD student at the Federal University of Uberlândia. I work in the Nanobiotechnology Lab, lab which is coordinated by Professor Luis Ricardo Goulart. First, I want to say I'm very on honored and grateful to have been selected to participate in this program. I learned a lot and got over limits. It was amazing, an amazing opportunity to meet and exchange with wonderful people. And about my project, we are developing a new type of diagnosis for coronavirus and a, uh, an electrochemical sensor, faster and cheaper form of diagnosis, where the use of reagents will be reduced. And the diagnosis can be made in the doctor's office by mobile app using saliva. The sensor can facilitate testing of patients, helping with the reporting of cases, and thus can help guide public policies about the pandemic. Thanks for the opportunity. I am already missing everyone. Okay, let's go for the next one. 
É tu que viu Leonardo? Ok. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, first, uh, I would like to thank the Dimension Science for the scholarship and the mentoring program. Uh, my name is Leonardo. I'm biologist and doctor of science at the Institute of Bioscience at MESP São Vicente, Brazil. And the purpose of my current research is to supply part of the national demand for molecular tests and used to diagnose COVID-19. And this project is a collaboration between UNESP and two startups, uh, BioBrayer and BioLinker. Uh, for this, using DNA technology, we uh, recombinant DNA technology, and uh, we developed the production process of two enzymes, uh, DNA polymerase and reverse transcriptase which are components of the molecular test called RT-PCR. Uh, in general, these enzymes are responsible for amplifying the genetic material of the SARS-CoV-2, which allows the virus detection. And since uh, Brazil is one of the most affected countries in the world by the COVID-19 pandemic, to avoid the shortage, we believe that the, the national inputs production is extremely important for Brazil. And this, is, this importance is due to the fact that one of the recommendations of the World Health Organization is to carry out mass testing to identify infected patients and isolate them, interrupting the virus transmission. So we hope that soon, we can contribute with the improvement of the Brazilian testing program. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Leonardo. I'd like to call Lilian, please. Hello, good morning. My name is Lilian Russo. I'm a biologist, PhD and postdoc at Chemistry Institute, Biochemistry Department and in, in the University of Sao Paulo. Our research aims to improve the serious symptoms of patients with COVID by improving the body's first line of defense, the innate immunity, and about how the organism realizes that it has an invader and how it's going to eliminate the threat. Uh, for that happen, uh, when a cell is infected with a virus, they produce mess messengers, which will tell to defend cells, hey, I'm infected. Come and eliminate me before the evil spreads out. At the same time, it begins producing antibodies. Uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus has a mechanism to silencing this warning. Uh, we are testing the capacity of 70 approved drugs about to reverse the silencing. Thus, the warning would be given and many viruses would be killed, uh, which would contain the beginning of the infection, reducing symptoms and giving to the body time to produce antibodies and eliminate the virus at all. Okay, thank you very much, Lilian. Uh, finally, I would like to call Romulo. So, hey, good morning, everyone. My name is Romulo Neris. I'm a biophysicist and currently a PhD candidate in inflammation and immunology at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. And in the past few months, uh, thanks to the Dimension Science Selection, I've been working with two main projects. So the first one, I'm studying a cellular system called immunoproteasome and how the system is relevant to the infection of COVID-19, mainly in immune, immune cells during the, the process of inflammation in the lung. The idea here is that if we can find major sources of mechanisms that the cells use to uh, react to the disease, we can maybe suggest some treatments and improve people's life during the infection, maybe the survival rate and other parameters. The second project is that uh, I'm analyzing the metabolites, things that are, that are produced during infection in common secretions like saliva. And the main idea here is to identify uh, compounds that are produced 
differently in different phases of the infection, maybe mild patients and severe patients. And the idea here is that soon we are able to predict which person is more likely to progress to, progress to a severe form of the disease even before they progress. So I'd like to thanks for the opportunity and for the scholarship. Okay, thank you very much, Romulo. I'm very proud of all, all you guys. Thank you very much for all your work done. Okay, with that, I pass the word to Pam. All right, here we go. And by the way, for those of you that enjoyed Brazilian Voices at the beginning of the program, stay here because we're going to have one more song from them um, near the end of the program. So I am very proud to introduce another critical member of the team, Professor Martha Gogino, PhD. Martha is the head of Dimension Sciences Scientific Advisory Board. She's a full professor at the Federal Institute of Education, Science and Technology of Sao Paulo, Brazil. Welcome, Martha. Uh, we hello. see you. Hello. Yeah, thank you, Pamela, for the kind introduction. And first of all, uh, it's very important to point out that I'm very happy and proud to be part of the Dimension Sciences. But now I would like to call Data Sprint's team to talk about challenges in STEM careers, a perspective from entrepreneurs. Welcome, André, Luis, and Thais. Hi everyone, uh, I can't uh, turn on my video. I think that's something happening here. Okay, now, now it's working. So uh, I'll present myself. I'm Luis Martins. I'm the CEO and co founder of Data Springs. Uh, we are a company uh, focused on custom data solutions. So we have uh, some, some branches, some components of our organization. One is the consultants where we can um, enter in large clients and really participate on the data-driven transformation of our clients. The other is the Academy Data Sprints that's very related to dimension science where we train um, our professionals to obtain uh, more practical uh, expertise on the on these data matters, and uh, we also have the the products where we we create spin-offs based on a methodology that we created, where we find recurrences in the market, we validate ideas, and then we bring these ideas uh, into market as a product, as a software as a service products where these products can be available for our clients. We will have like a very brief presentation. So uh, I prefer not to use the, the, the slides, right? Because uh, I talked to Bob, so we, you're going to have only 10 minutes. So I'll just uh, present myself and uh, explain what we, we see with Dimension Science and all the, the scholars that they have. Uh, Daily Sprints, it's a, it's a company that has uh, like now 50 uh, employees and we have people uh, with uh, grad people, uh, uh, PhDs and masters. And one of the things that we, we have with the data career is to, is to obtain some domain knowledge. So we have some data scientists that work for finance and we have some data scientists that work for oncology, cancer detection, and they all need uh, computational skills, but they also need uh, domain knowledge. So they will need to understand what they are doing that specific uh, industry, that specific vertical. Uh, for that case, we are creating like relationships uh, and strategic partnerships with universities, uh, some own some organizations that can help us to create connections with this uh, academic side. 
So this is very important to us. Uh, so talking a little bit about me, uh, I work at uh, Embraer, it's an aeronautics company, uh, one of the largest in the world of uh, development of airplanes. And then I went to France after I went to Canada, and then I work as a consultant in the United States. On the United States, I work for several clients. And uh, on the United States, I saw like this big picture of creating a company that we could have like a very deep technology understanding of what we are doing and we could uh, uh, bring more people to work on this endeavor. Uh, this, is, this is very important for Brazil because Brazil, it's, uh, nowadays we see a lot, lots of companies like fintechs, marketing techs and all of that. And uh, Data Sprint is a deep tech company. So we are very focused on creating uh, intellectual property, creating technology, creating products, and uh, we we need people to work with us to create all these aspects of this uh, this entrepreneurship endeavor. Uh, I would uh, ask uh, uh, Gortari to say about uh, a little bit about management on our side. So I talk a little bit about my uh, life. What is data sprints? Uh, Gortari will talk a, a little bit about management. How can we manage like these uh, so diverse uh, teams that we have? People like you have people that have one year of experience, and we have uh, advisors that have more than thirty years of experience of international experience abroad in Brazil, Latin America, and all that. So he will talk about management, and after Thais will talk about COVID Lake. That's our volunteer project where we can have access for scientists to work on data related to COVID-19. So we created a large uh, data lake to have uh, public data, governmental data, and private data in one place. So, Gortari. Hey guys, can you listen to me? Is this mic working? Yeah, yeah. Can we... yeah, yeah. okay, so. Can listen. Morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Andrea. They call me Gortari here because my last name. Uh, I'm current the DPM of Data Sprints. Uh, DPM is a data project manager. Uh, and I'm going to talk a, a little bit about the, the challenges of doing this kind of project here in Brazil and also with some partners around the globe. Um, mainly, the data project is something new on the market. Uh, the positions we we have open here to to fulfill the the projects are kind of new. There isn't any kind of uh, graduation of data engineering or data science. So the, the the main challenge for us here is to find the right people to do the right job and then orchestrate the the components of this project. So I, I can say today. Uh, as I was hearing you guys saying about all your project and uh, everyone here is, is full academic. And I, I have to say that if you guys uh, want to, to get in the, the market, the data market, uh, you, have, you, you have to break this, this first layer of uh, the, the, the wrong impression that if you have to work with data, you must know how to program, you must know, uh, you must be geeky uh, you, you already have a, a great set of skills you develop in the graduation and post doctor and doctorate and you can you can get all of the the, the hard skills to 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 get the job in this kind of uh, high tech company uh, just by getting into the position and then starting to learn with someone uh, more more with more technical skills. Uh, so why I'm saying this because our our main main problem here today is to find the the, the people to get the job done to have all the the, the soft skills set to to learn how to build some uh, infrastructure how to uh, manage to to work by themselves on the project uh, without the the delay any any tasks and. I, I think my, my contribution here for you guys is to invite you to understand data data scenario, the data projects, 
and and try to dive on this road because when you when you start to do some some kind of uh, work like you guys were doing uh, with COVID like with COVID nineteen, uh, you you are doing analysis and telling uh, for the right policies the, the right politicians to do uh, to orient them uh, towards the, the the right policies. But what if you can scale this and show uh, more people uh, what they have to do, how they have to behave to avoid this kind of scenario, dramatic scenario we are living right now. Uh, you can do this through technology. And so I, I'm inviting you guys to understand more about this world and open ourselves here to, to give you guys the opportunity to see this and how can you apply your skill set academic skill set to our technical uh, skill set and also Thais is going to talk about this project we have here uh, uh, we, we, we built this towards uh, solutions for COVID-19 and she's going to talk a little bit more thank you everyone thank you Luis thank you Andre uh, um, it's a pleasure to be here with you. So, good morning, everyone. I am Business Development Representative at Data Sprints, and I'm going to briefly introduce the voluntary project ideal idealized by Data Sprints earlier this year with the outbreak of the new coronavirus. Uh, so, in the beginning of the pandemic in Brazil, we saw a great spread of misinformation and not so reliable data. So, COVID Lake, uh, the name of the project, Emerged, uh, emerged from a desire to revolutionize the way Brazil integrates information about COVID-19 by centralizing this information in just one, place, just one place. So the trigger was to guarantee accessibility, security, integrity of those information to be used by researchers and also by the general public. And then uh, we gather specialists from different areas across the country to work together and develop uh, an oriented data lake that would store public and private health, uh, health data related to COVID-19 in a unified, scalable, uh, resilient, and auditable way and enable the creation of interactive dashboards with Microsoft Power BI and Tableau and also create predictive models. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, today we have a team of 27 volunteers, including engineer, business leaders, uh, PMOs, scientists, and we also have uh, do we also have doctors. We have PhDs in linguistics, microbiology, and two in theoretical physics, and a master in statistics. So. The plan, uh, the next steps, uh, if we were presenting the slides, <laughs> I create a slide for the next, the, the future of the, the, COVID, the project. So the plan is that in the future, the project is going to become a health lake, integrating data related to several endemic diseases in Brazil, with the possibility to be the main source of health information in the country. So we have a lot of endemic diseases such as Chagas and another endemic diseases in Brazil. So the future of the, pro the project will be uh, to become a health lake. Uh, you, I, will put, I will type here in the chat the access to our project. Our website is covidlake.com.br and our general email is filicon at covidlake.com.br. So if you want to be a partner, we currently have technological partners, including Amazon Web Services, in which we use Amazon S3 to storage the data, the data lake, and Dreamio for the data lake engine and to catalog the data. And we also have data providers partners. So if you want to be a partner or if you want to be a volunteer or just to have access to our API, you can enter in our website or send an email and then I will get in touch with you to give you access to our work. Uh, I will type here in the in the chat. So if so, I think uh, in, in general lines, that's it. So thank you so much. Uh, you're go if uh, I, I can talk a little bit about the architecture. I don't know if we have data scientists or data engineer here, but we use Amazon S3 uh, in the Amazon cloud to storage data lake. We use Dreamio for 
the lake engine into data catalog and we collect and transform the data into pipelines using Colitics, which is a product designed by data sprints or just Python, Python scripts. And I think that's it. If Luis and Andre uh, would like to, to compliment me or help me with some uh, important information, uh, it would be, it would be nice, but oh, Felipe already, already gave you the information in the chat our website covidleak.com.br and I will just type our general email. And just again, uh, I'm, we are inviting you guys to check on this project. Yeah. Uh, it can be really helpful for developing more uh, skill set of tech uh, side of your career. And you know, data is a new oil, so let's, let's join this. Thank you everyone. Thank you. We have a number of questions that have come in. Um, and so, you know, as you know, Sorry. Dimensions Sciences is um, uh, comprised of scientists and entrepreneurs. So there's some questions about the combination of those things, how they intersect. So the first one would be, um, what were the main difficulties of starting a data science company in Brazil? What were the struggles? And okay, I'll... so can I, can I answer or, okay? Please. No, I think okay. you, are, you are the best to answer this question. So uh, I would say that's almost impossible. Uh, I look back then if I, if I knew all the challenges that I would have, sometimes I think that if I was still continue uh, to, to willing to start the company, because back then at the beginning it was like a nightmare. Uh, it's, a, it's a very complex market because uh, if you know IT, like IT, it's, uh, it's, it's difficult to, to rise a team in IT nowadays. And on the data side, it's even more difficult. When I was a data scientist in my LinkedIn, I used to receive like one international proposal to work abroad for per week. And some of our professionals, they receive like three proposals uh, to work in other companies in Brazil, like per week. So it's very difficult to like to uh, create a, a team of data professionals, uh, engage that team and uh, make everyone like communicate to everyone the purpose, the vision and the north that we are willing to have in the company. The, the other side is, uh, is the mar uh, Brazilian market. So when I worked in the United States, we were very, um, we were uh, very related to the data science, artificial intelligence layer. So uh, I would sit with the C-level CEOs, CTOs, and we would talk about artificial intelligence. But the problem is with the data, database, the infrastructure, the cloud infrastructure, most of the time is the, the health of the data wasn't that good. So when, when I returned to Brazil and I found the company with my partner, Alan, he's the co-founder of uh, Data Hackers, very thousand uh, data professionals there. We talked, about this, we talked about this strategy and we had a common goal to be an end-to-end -end data custom uh, solution company. Because when you think about end-to-end, -end, you need to assess the capabilities of a company. Like the homeward, they, they, they have the, like the, the, the data team. They, do they have like the, 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 the technology, like the budget? So after you have all this profiling, then you have a company uh, that you can work for. And the first like one year and a half, we really struggle to find like the addressable market, the clients that would really want the, the services that we were providing. So I would say that it was very difficult. Uh, and I would say that now we are in a very, um, in a very uh, sensitive time to really uh, have a, uh, to enter in the later growth uh, stage of a company into a scale up. So uh, we are aiming very high. So now the, the purpose, the aspiration of companies to be the number one in Latin America for custom data solutions and top five in the Americas. So that uh, includes uh, 
United States, Canada, and all that for by three years from now. So we have three years to get there. So what are you looking for uh, in scientists? You said you have scientists that work for you, you have PhDs. What kind of attributes and skills are you looking for from your scientists and how do you recruit them? We have some potential employees here for you. Totally, we know that. So I'm going to, to talk about uh, what we normally uh, seek on scientists. So first is to have like a, a thesis on some of the areas that we work on. Nowadays, the Springs has like five verticals. We work finance, we work with uh, healthcare, we work with uh, transport and heavy industries like mining. So one of the main things is to have scientists align like the domain expertise of the scientists. Like if it's in health, it, it needs to be related to one of our verticals. This is the first thing. After we see that most of the scientists that you will need uh, more uh, familiarity with the uh, programming skills. So some of them, they work with programming during uh, the, the research, but then we would need like a next level. And then we are creating an acceleration program in data sprints to give them these hard skills. So uh, mainly are like uh, to get to know more about programming, not just about like some pieces of code, but really have a broad perspective of how this uh, piece of code can be implemented and can be really absorbed by the production environment of a client. So it's very different from just coding and having something work for a, a project. It really needs to be uh, integrated into an environment. The other thing is about Unix. So most of the scientists, sometimes they are uh, familiar with Windows, that's an uh, operating system that's not very used on our uh, market. So we see that uh, scientists, they need to get more familiar with Unix and Linux. The other thing is uh, subversion. Some, some scientists, depending on the university, they are used to SVN, that's a kind of subversion system. Nowadays, we use a lot of Git. The superversion it's important because we, you are not working alone. You'll be working with like sometimes hundreds of other people and we need to have a system to integrate everything that it's been doing and that can update the, the complete work in the end. So this is the mainly, uh, the mainly skills that we are seeking for. So in the end, it's a, a computational familiarity that we are willing to provide to scientists. So we are creating this acceleration program to people that uh, already uh, completed their PhD. And we are also uh, seeking for scientists that have their research related to the verticals that we are, we are aiming to. Okay, wonderful. So let me make this a little more personal for the three of you. Um, not sure about your backgrounds, but I assume that each of you was doing something that wasn't working for a brand new entrepreneurial company at some point. So let me ask Luis and then Dice and then, um, and then you, how did you make the transition from one world into this very fast moving startup. What was that like? So Luis? Okay, so uh, I work like before entering this startup uh, world, I worked for almost like 10 years in different, uh, different multinationals. So I worked for Azab, that's a welding and cutting, welding and cutting company. I work at uh, Embraer, that's a, a airplane development company. I work at, uh, at IBM. I worked with um, uh, a data consultant in the United States. And after uh, this career, then I changed to, the, to my entrepreneurship side. Uh, and my background, I did um, a course, a technician course at Cefeti. So I'm a mechatronics technician. Then I studied uh, at UFMG uh, as a mechanical engineer. And all my experience was in the technical background. I, I didn't like uh, uh, almost nothing the business side. And then after I, I started this transition to the to, to entrepreneurship, I started to like really search and 
and learn a lot about like lean startup, uh, blue ocean strategy, all these like main books, this main methodology that you need to know to create your company. So Thais can go. Ah, thank you. So you started to learn about strategy and management skills and organizations uh, yeah, to build. Like, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thais and then um, uh, Andre. 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 Uh -huh. So I don't really know how to answer to your question because I was not planning to enter in a technological field or a data field in the beginning. Actually, my initial plan was to enter in diplom diplomatic field uh, regarding politics and economics. And when I decided to graduate in business, my mindset started to change and I I really, uh, I was really interested, interested by uh, technology and data and then uh, my my path just changed a little bit and those information starts to come at me and i started to to study and to learn uh, several things regarding regarding protection data regarding python and programming and then i i found <laughs> the data sprints uh, at in linkedin so uh and i applied to to, to enter as a business development representative. And I'm actually, my, my transition is, uh, is happening right now. You know, I, 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 it's, not, uh, it's not a complete, it's not com complete yet. I am, I, am, I am still learning about data and about technology every day. So uh, I, can, I can answer you how it was to change to uh, from business and from politics to technology and data, but I'm still looking forward to do it uh, in the best way possible. <laughs> okay, so we'll ask you again in five years. <laughs> so, yeah, and I've heard <laughs> maybe two. The, maybe the best. <laughs> I've heard two mentions of LinkedIn so far, which I want to note for our scientists. So, Andre. So I have a very a pretty hybrid background. Uh, I also, as I, I started looking for a more political and diplomatic career, so I started to, stu to study uh, international relations here in Brazil. But during my my how can I say my journey, uh, I started to see, to see that it ain't for me. So in the main course, I, I started to learn how to code in Python, uh, how to understand uh, the, what is a data warehouse, data lake, and make uh, several courses in, uh, in this tech field. And stuff come really or pretty organic for me after this. I started to work as an intern on a tech company here, uh, a startup. Uh, I, I stood there for four years, and then uh, I, 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 there I worked as a commercial then marketing, then uh, tech representative, and then CRM specialist. After this, I started uh, in another startup here, uh, the biggest uh, uh, in the in the field they work for. I don't know if I can say, it, but and and then there I started to lead teams. I started to I started the the BI team there, and then my friend Alan, the the associate from Luis, uh, he invited me to join Data Sprints when they were like. Four people. I was the, the the number five, and now here I am. We have this big team, great projects, really challenging project, and could be couldn't be more happier. Thank you. So this is a young company, um, and one of the things that we've talked to our scientists about, and that they have talked about, is the importance of having mentors. Did any of you have a mentor? And or do you mentor others now? Like the they start like the whole uh, founding, the beginning of the company was based on mentors. So our first advisor and mentor was Renato Reis, the ex CIO of uh, Orlando City and current director of uh, Lactan for Salesforce and Velocity. So Velocity was uh, was in, like uh, maybe three or four months ago was acquired by Salesforce, but uh, uh, Velocity get the, the, the coin term of uh, being a unicorn. So uh, nowadays it's value more than $1 billion. 
we have uh, like a, a very strong advi uh, advisory board. So since the beginning, uh, I, I was the, like the most concerned about having mentors and having advisors to really guide us in different aspects. Because for example, Renato Reis is the, our advisor for international, internationalization. We have a mentor like Luis Pratis, that's one of the partners of uh, Falcone, he's the largest uh, management consultants in Brazil. He's our advisor for like consultants. We have um, Clarid, it's one of our mentors. He's uh, a partner of Wildlife, that's another unicorn that uh, it's, it was created here in Brazil. He's our uh, mentor for business development. So we, we really connected all these relationships that uh, I did back then in my career. My partner did all these uh, professionals that we met uh, along the data sprints uh, work. And uh, we, we really connected with them in a very persistent uh, way. So one of the things that I'm very specialized in now is like, how to like to be mentored and how to mentor because it's something part of our culture to really ask for help for people that already like really did that journey that we are willing to make and most of them they didn't create a unicorn from zero but uh, if you put all the pieces together we have an, enough uh, knowledge to, to mm -hmm. make that someday okay all right, so one last question and I'll let um, anyone answer who wants to answer. What is the one, and you heard me ask for a Twitter version before, so I'm going to ask you for a Twitter version of your answer. What is the one piece of advice you would give to a young scientist or young person who wants to transition into the private industry? Oh, that's a difficult one. Uh, one piece uh, of advice. I would say, like, it does sound cliche, but uh, I would say that you need to work with what you love, you know? So uh, most, of, most of my life, uh, I, I try to work. On, I have the opposite problem that most of the people. I, I love everything. So I need to, <laughs> to choose what I really love the most. Okay. So I, I think that's the, I don't agree with that. You need to choose what you love and what you make money. If you're really good in what you love, you will make money with that. You just need to work in an intelligent manner. But I would say to, to really understand what's happening on your research, on, on your professors. Re, you said LinkedIn, like uh, access LinkedIn, see what's, uh, I was talking with my girlfriend. She's a master. She did her, her master's science. And she was saying that LinkedIn is not good, but uh, if you use LinkedIn in a perspective of uh, really working the private sector, you're going to see like the fits and connections of what you did, with the current jobs that are opening. So I would say like do what you love and do it in, in an intelligent manner, an intelligent way to, to make it all glue together. And it sounds like you said, investigate, research, look around as well. So and yeah, Andre, do you have um, Twitter advice to someone moving into the private sector? Yeah, I, I guess uh, uh, I'll speak with Luis. Uh, I see like every day I, I see data scientists that are frustrated because they work with something they don't believe or they don't, don't want to keep following these and the projects stay too long and they start to be more and more depressed. So the, the, main, the main thing you, you gotta do is find something you really like to do, then stick to this. Don't and drift apart. Thank you. And Thais, I'll ask you something a little different. Um, uh, what is the most important thing for a new employee in a business to focus on as they learn? The most yeah, just just a the second, most please. Mm. Just a second, please. Sorry, sorry. Go, go, go ahead. Okay. Uh, the most important thing for a new employee to focus on while you, while you're learning. Yes. Um, let me think. But uh, I think I think 
uh, career is the most is the important thing to focus on because I think everything you do during your journey as a new employee will uh, will have some consequences for your career in the future. So you, I, I think for me it's important to have those steps really clear and where you want to get or maybe in the general in the over uh, in the general uh, in the big picture where do you want to get and and what, what do you want to achieve? Uh, because if you have a plan or if you have goals, if you have dreams, it's always easy to focus in what, what matters while you're learning and while you're having uh, your professional experiences. I am a really young <laughs> employee. I, I am really new uh, at, this, at this business field. And I'm, it's, it's hard for me to, to to say uh, what the most important thing to focus on because everything for me is important. <laughs> I am just like Louise. I, I I I like everything and I have and I, I want to to do a little bit of everything to to have uh, a great package and more experience. So I think you just need to have to have a plan <laughs> to okay. to organize your okay. ideas and organize uh, where do you want to yeah. where do you want to get. I'm sorry to interrupt this, okay. there is a, a delay here but uh, uh we have a, a question from homolo here uh homolo you, you can i can i can i read the question here pam i'm sorry but we're out of time which oh, is okay. why i did not ask the question i apologize um, so, so. so uh, homolo you can find me on linkedin and i can answer for this Oh, thank you so much. That's a wonderful idea. So I want to thank the three of you so much. We have so many positive comments about what you presented today. And um, yes, um, if each of you would put your LinkedIn um, connection, if you have one, and or how to contact you at the company in the chat box, that would be fantastic. And then people could follow up um, to you when they want to after the program. So thank you so much for your time today. We really appreciate it. So thank I'm you, very Mary. happy to welcome back now um, the beautiful group that opened our program at the beginning, and that is um, Brazilian Voices. So welcome back, and everyone relax and enjoy some beautiful music. Oh, image okay. and sound. Okay. Image and sound. Can you hear us? Can you hear it? We were so inspired by all the presentations. Pamela, thank you so much, Bob and Marcia, and everyone part of this, this project because I'm so sorry that we changed our repertoire because, you know, we rehearsed and, and, and yesterday we told you we would be doing like a classical bossa nova, but after listening to Britney, to Kirby, it was just like we have to do something that represents women and Brazilian women, Carmen Miranda, right, Bia? Yes, you remember the lady with the fruits in her head, right? Uh, she was very famous here, a Brazilian born in Portugal, famous here in the U.S. in the 40s and 50s. So there's a song called Disseram que eu voltei americanizada. They told me I came back to Brazil to do a performance Americanized. So we're going to perform this song, uh, but at, the, at her core, the Brazilian aspect Brazilian culture was there with her all the time even though they thought she was Americanizada Americanizada right yeah she opened so many doors for women uh, especially in this industry as well so uh, we got inspired by you and yeah. we just changed a little bit is that okay Marcia but we're gonna see you doing the Carmen Miranda I'm sorry Dr. Marcia but you're gonna be seeing at the beginning of the song there's going to be a little different a new part, arrangement a little Beethoven like thing okay so let's let's do it Que eu voltei a me 
do molho ritmo nem nada E dos bala canta já nem existe mais nenhum mais pra cima de mim Pra que tanto veneno? Eu posso lá voltar americanizada Eu que nasci no samba e vivo no terreiro Topando a noite inteira a velha batucada Nas rosas de malandro minhas preferidas Eu digo mesmo, eu chamo e nunca I love you Enquanto houver Brasil na hora das comidas Eu sou do camarão e sou padinho com chuchu Disseram que eu voltei americanizada Com burro do dinheiro que estou muito rica Que não suporto mais o prego do pandeiro E fico arrepiado vindo mato no rica Disseram que com as mãos estão preocupada E corre por aí que eu sinto o zum zum Que já não tenho molho, ritmo nem nada E dos baladandas já nem existe mais nenhum Mais pra cima de mim Pra que tanto veneno? Eu posso lá voltar na mesa pisada Eu que nasci no samba e vivo no terreiro Tô passando a noite inteira, velha batucada nas rodas de malandro, minhas preferidas Eu digo mesmo, eu te amo e nunca I love you Enquanto houver Brasil na hora das comidas Eu sou do camarão e sou padinho com chuchu Oh, thank you. That was just beautiful as before. We appreciate you so much. I can't even begin to tell you. Thank you thank so you. much for thank being here today. Thank you very much. Congratulations. Thank you. All right. So we have a special slide to say thank you to you. Um, we, you know, you are one of our sponsors. You have made this event um, doubly enjoyable because of your participation. So we just want to take a moment to also thank our other partners and sponsors before we congratulate our scholars. The JP Morgan Charitable Giving Fund, Drummond Advisors, Fidelity Charitable, Melt, The Ardian Group, Brazilian Voices, and The Brazilian Report. Now I'd like to welcome back our founder and co-founder, Bob and Marcia. Bob and Marcia, you may be on mute. Hello, everybody. Hello, Marcia. Hello. Wow, that was terrific. That was a wonderful. So, so Marcia, yeah. is this the end? We're at the end of the scholarship cycle. What do we do now? No, I think this is just the beginning. The scholars now have a great journey um, on their accomplishments, and we have a lot of work to do to continue our mission uh, to inclusion of minorities in science. Thank you, everybody, for participating. <clears throat> Thank you. And before we go, we would like to share a call to action. Uh, Dimension Sciences is a nonprofit we need your support to help fund our programs that you see on the board. We're hoping to make this easy for you by including a QR code that you can just snap through your phone. Any donation amount will be helpful to us. Um, and again, we could really use your support. If you'd like to follow us and keep updated, and not only perhaps on the, this recording, but on uh, articles, posts, uh, lots of different things that we have available. You can find us on all of these social media sites. Um, uh, we are very active there. And again, a huge congratulations to all of our scholars today. Uh, thank you everyone for your ongoing support and we will see you very soon. Thank you.